All right, thanks everyone for coming out to the men's Bible study. If you have a Bible with you and you want to follow along, you can turn along with us into Acts chapter 20. We're going to be doing the first part of Acts chapter 20 tonight, and then next week we'll do the last part of Acts chapter 20. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Here it is, October 4th, and um, my name is Tom Truxton. I'm one of the assisting pastors here at the bridge, so great to see everybody. And before we get into the teaching tonight, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to uh, share your word and, Lord, just come together as a group of men. Lord, as the ladies are always also in a, an adjacent room, Lord, we pray for them and I pray, Lord, that you would bless them as they're coming together also in fellowship and to hear your word being taught. And Lord, we just pray for the ladies and the men here in this room, Lord, that we'd all be able to hear some little nugget, a little piece of your word, Lord, that we'll be able to take with us when we leave tonight that it will somehow just bless us and encourage us. And Lord, something that we'll be able to just nibble on and maybe even it'll, something might be said that we're, uh, just cause us to want to go back and do a little Bible study ourselves, a little word study, or who knows what it may lead to. And that's what's so cool about uh, digging into your word. And Lord, I, I pray that um, we'll just have a blessed time tonight. Uh, maybe afterwards when I'm done, we'll have some back and forth discussion. Whatever you desire, Lord, we just pray that, uh, I pray that I won't get in the way. And Lord, that my words will be your words. So again, thank you, Lord, for tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. So Acts chapter 20. I've got a, a study tool here that I go to sometimes. Uh, the Haley's Bible Handbook. I don't know if you guys heard about this or not. Um, it's a, an awesome summary of uh, the whole Bible, and it's got a lot of archaeological information, a lot of Bible history in it. I, I used this one, actu this whole book, one year as my um, devotional to read through the Bible in a year type thing, but I read through this in a year. You can see it's quite thick, just like your Bible is, um, but it came across um, uh, a, it's just called a summary of Paul's life. So I thought I would read it just kind of as a, I, I know some of you hadn't been here for all of the teachings. I know I haven't been here for all of the teachings, uh, so that's not a guilt trip on anybody because I've missed a lot and just life happens. Um, so here we are though in Acts chapter 20, so all of the teachings that have led up to Acts chapter 20 uh, are going to be somewhat summarized in this little um, half a page um, summary. So let's um, use this uh, before we get into um, the passages in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 16 is where we're going to cover tonight. So a summary of Paul's life. Paul first appears as a persecutor of Christians, resolutely determined to blot out the name of Jesus. No doubt he thought the resurrection of Jesus was, no doubt he thought the resurrection of Jesus from the dead was a fixed up story. That's, this is Paul when he was known as Saul way back before the Damascus Road experience in Acts chapter 9. Uh, so this is, again, the, the bad Paul uh, early in his life. Then on the road to Damascus, as by a stroke from heaven, he was smitten down. Jesus himself spoke to him, and this was about A.D. 32. A.D. 32. From the moment he was a changed man, with zeal and devotion unparalleled in history, he went up and down the highways of the Roman Empire crying out, Jesus did rise from the dead. It is true, it is true, it is true. He is risen, he is risen, he is risen. In Damascus they tried to kill him, and then he went to Arabia. And then back to Damascus he came. Then returned to Jerusalem, and now it was about A.D. 35. They tried to kill him there also. Then he went to Tarsus. In Antioch, about A.D. 42 to 44, you can see about seven years of... Um, transgressed during this time when he left Jerusalem and went to Tarsus and now in Antioch, AD 42 to 44, um, now he went up to Jerusalem once again in AD 44 with an offering of money for the poor. Now his first missionary journey, we're going to read about four different missionary journeys that Paul uh, essentially went on. In Acts chapter 20, we're up to his third missionary journey that he's about ready to complete in Acts chapter 20. So first missionary journey was about A.D. 45 to A.D. 48. It was in Galatia, uh, Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, and then he returned to Antioch. Then there was the conference at Jerusalem about 
the Gentile circumcision about AD 50, and that was in Acts chapter 15. Um, so if you remember maybe who, I'm not sure who was taught Acts chapter 15 in this study. Does anybody remember who that was? It was about the Jerusalem Council. Um, I must have been traveling. Joel? I think, okay. Uh, then we went into the second missionary journey, about AD 50 to 53, which is where tra um, Paul traveled to Greece, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, and then he returned to Jerusalem and then to Antioch. This third missionary journey now, about AD 54 to 57, he was in Ephesus, Greece, then back to Jerusalem around AD 57, 58, with a great offering of money that he had collected during his third missionary journey. And then in Caesarea, AD 58 to 60, he was a prisoner in the governor's castle. In Rome now, AD 61 to 63, he was a prisoner. Here, the book of Acts ends. So we haven't got there yet in our studies, but we will. Then, back in Greece and Asia Minor, about AD 65 to 66, he was beheaded in Rome about AD 67. So the whole history of Paul here. His ministry lasted about 35 years. In those 35 years, he won vast multitudes, not a multitude, but a multitudes of people to Christ. At time, God helped him with miracles. In almost every city, he was persecuted. Again and again, they mobbed him and tried to kill him. He was beaten, scourged, imprisoned, stoned, driven from city to city. On top of all this, his thorn in the flesh that we read about in 2 Corinthians 12, his sufferings are almost unbelievable. He must have had a constitution like iron. God must have used supernatural power to keep him alive. So for those of you that have been around for, again, many studies through the book of Acts that we've covered, you've, you've read about or you've heard being taught many different um, situations that Paul has been through. And uh, in the book of First and Second Corinthians, there's a lot more of the history of Paul's life beyond what uh, I just read there from Haley's Bible handbook. All right, so now let's read... Uh, verses 1 through 16. Actually, um, I guess I should be able to read this one. This, as I mentioned, this is Paul's third missionary journey that we're reading about tonight, and this takes place in AD 53 to 57. So, Acts chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embracing them and departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region, encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up and broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take Paul on board, for he had given orders intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. The next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if at all possible, on the day of Pentecost. All right, so there's our passage of Scripture for tonight, and I'm going to try and reiterate um, going through these uh, verses and put the slide up on the screen so you can kind of read it as I go. So, 
After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. So where did this uproar come from? It just mentioned an uproar. And they were there in Ephesus thinking that they were going to go back to Jerusalem. But then he decides, really, I need to go to Macedonia. I'm going to show you a map in a little bit that kind of shows you where Jerusalem is in relationship to Macedonia. And you may think, well, shoot, if he wants to go to Jerusalem, why is he going to Macedonia? Because Jerusalem is east and Macedonia is north and west of where he's at right now. But again, this uproar. Uh, they're in Ephesus, about ready to leave from there. And from historical accounts, I was able to determine that there was maybe about 25,000 people in this theater there in Ephesus. Uh, some, some of you in this room may have actually been to Israel. Well, not actually Israel. It's more over uh, on the western side of, I guess, present-day Turkey area. I haven't been there, but I've been to Israel. And there are remnants of ruins there. But in Ephesus, there's still some stones um, and stuff that you can see. Is that the trip that you went on, went on Pastor Harry? No. No, okay. I think it was, I can't remember, it was the most recent trip where they took that tour around um, uh, Greece and uh, Turkey and then across the Mediterranean to Crete and then back over to Jerusalem. Um, anyhow, they would have seen the remnants there in Ephesus. And they were, what I was able to dig up and learn was a lot of times they made these theaters, these places of entertainment, roughly large enough to encompass about 10% of what the typical population was of the city. So the population of the city was guesstimated to be around a quarter of a million people, 250,000. So 10% of 250,000 is 25,000 people. So that's roughly probably the size of this theater, this amphitheater that was there in Ephesus. So you can imagine if you go back to read what happened there in Acts chapter 19 that um, Steve taught us on last week, there was a riot taking place. And there was a lot of people there in the amphitheater there in Ephesus. There was an uproar going on. And this is the noise that we're hearing. Notice also it says Paul embraced them. Um, you know, embrace. To me, that's walking up to somebody and giving them a, a big hug. Uh, if you've been here at the bridge long enough, uh, you've noticed that we do that quite often, especially for people that are uh, attending here and already know each other. It's not uncommon to walk up to somebody and just give them a hug. Not just a handshake, but usually a handshake that grabs them in, they slap you on the back type thing, especially the guys. Um, so Paul was in the habit of doing that as well, it sounds like. He wasn't afraid to embrace his uh, fellow brothers in Christ. So that was a pretty cool thing to see that it captured that in scripture as well, that Paul uh, was close enough to his disciples that he just loved, and loved being with them. So giving hugs is not a bad thing. So again, as I mentioned, the geography. Uh, Paul is moving his way from Ephesus, going northwest to Macedonia. So why was he doing this? Why was he going westward to Macedonia if he really wanted to go back to Jerusalem? Well, Paul wanted to collect an offering. Uh, we read about that in a, a different passage in Acts, but also there's two other parallel passages that let us know of Paul's intention, really, to actually, before he goes back to Jerusalem, he wants to collect an offering. One of those passages is in here in Romans 15, 25, and 26. So it says, But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. So there's one passage, and then another one is here in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So it's interesting that at the first day of the week, first day of the week is Sunday, and he was encouraging them, imploring them to already have the collection ready for his arrival and that they were made plans to do that. So, oh, there's also, sorry, verse 13 and 14. And when I come, whenever you, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if, it, but if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So again, it's very clear that he was wanting to collect an offering to take it back to the poor of Jerusalem. Here is the map, and this is his third missionary journey, again, starting in 53 A.D., uh, going up to around 58. 
and starting over here initially in Antioch, but we pick it up in Acts chapter 20, we're over here now, getting ready to head up that way into Macedonia. So you can see if you follow the little arrowheads, we're going to be going up that way, making it all the way through Thessalonica down to Corinth, and then we're thinking we're going to leave from here and sail back to Jerusalem, or back to here and make our way down to Jerusalem. He wants to make it back here for Passover. That's not going to happen, we're going to find out. Things are, his plans are going to change, and then he's eventually going to make it decide not to sail from here, and he's going to walk all the way back around and then finally get on a boat over here, come over to Troas, make his way down the coast, and then sail back to here, now hoping to get back to Jerusalem for the um, Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. So his plans get changed just like our plans get changed often. And sometimes we have to be willing and able to, to cope with things that happen in our life. So I mentioned a couple passages of scripture, the Romans passage and the 1 Corinthians passage, about how did we know that Paul wanted to collect this offering. And the timing is important for Paul to know that he's an emphasis and wants to collect something in Macedonia in the passages I read from, were from Romans. Well, when was Romans written? Romans was written by Paul when he was in Corinth. So when Paul was down here in AD 57, he wrote the book of Romans. Remember, his missionary journey doesn't end until AD 58 when he finally gets back to here. So this is very near the end of his third missionary journey. 1 Corinthians was written from Ephesus, in the spring of 56 AD. So this was near, right, kind of right in the middle of this third missionary journey when he was in Ephesus for about three years and he wrote the book to the Corinthians, the first book of Corinthians. The second book of Corinthians was when he was in the fall of uh, 56. Uh, also, he wrote that from Macedonia. So all this, to, the dates are important because to know that he was wanting to collect an offering to take back to Jerusalem. We had to know when those were written and that they, those took place before where he is now in the book of Acts chapter 20. So that timeline, I just wanted to lay that out in front of you so we had a good picture of the books that I referenced and why they were in chronological order based on when he wrote them. So Acts 20, verse 2 and 3. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So if we go back, Greece, what we call Greece now, is kind of this area of Corinth. So this whole area right here is current day Greece, but they called it Corinth. And he was getting on, wanting to get on a ship there and sail all the way back to Jerusalem area. Uh, but that didn't happen. The Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria. So this is a problem. First, I want to go back to the word encouraged. Encouraged means to fill with courage. But it has a fuller range of meanings, such as from rebuking to comforting. It is, and it includes instruction, affirmation, warning, and correction. So... Encourage is not just to fill with courage, but there's a lot of other intonations into the word of encouraged. And sailing to Syria meant that he would be getting on what they call a pilgrim ship. A pilgrim ship would have been in the cities here of Achaia or Corinth or, or Athens is where he would have boarded one of these ships, a pilgrim ship, to make his way over to Jerusalem for Passover. The plots against Paul, though, he heard about uh, either through his disciples or word of mouth rumblings or something. And it would have been real easy for Paul to get on a ship and make this long voyage across the Mediterranean Sea. And if there were people on the ship that just didn't like Paul uh, for one reason or another, it would have been real easy to dispatch Paul one night in the middle of the night, in the dark of the night, throw him overboard, and no one would hear from Paul once ever again. So that was entirely possible. Uh, but this pilgrim ship was basically collecting a lot of Christians and Jews from around that area that were wanting to come back to Jerusalem for Passover, and Paul was intending to do that. But because of the people that were plotting against him, he decided to go by foot. 
So he was being led of the Lord not to get on that boat, and it, it probably saved his life. So verse 4. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristocharchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. So verses 4 and 5 here. Notice all these different names, which are hard to pronounce. Uh, I had to do a little practicing. I probably still didn't get them perfect. <laughs> but there's a lot of different people accompanying Paul. So notice it takes kind of, what, I mean, when you have many people going together from one place to another, you might call that a team. So it takes a team a lot of times to do ministry. Um, and I would challenge you to look around the bridge, as an instance, and try and find any ministry here that's done by one person. I'm not sure of any one ministry that's done by one person. There's always got to be a backup. There's got to be somebody else that's playing a part in making sure that this ministry takes place on whatever day it takes place on, whether it's a Tuesday night like tonight or Wednesday morning, which is when the ladies have their Bible study, or a Thursday night service or a Sunday morning service. There, and all of you have been here long enough, you know that there's tons of different ministries that take place, sometimes led by a group of men, sometimes by a group of women, sometimes a mixture of both, like our Sparkle team. That's a huge team taking place to make ministry happen. Paul had a team that was traveling with him, and he liked that. Paul knew that it took fellowship, and it was important, and therefore he did not travel alone. I don't think there's a, a single passage in Scripture where he traveled alone. Sure, he got in his alone space sometimes, just like Jesus did many times. He would find a, a time of the day, usually early in the morning, and go in a, find a quiet place, either on a mountain, on a hillside, or out on the lake, and just pray. But Paul knew that fellowship was important, and he did not travel alone. We need fellowship in large groups and small groups. Uh, some of the people here are probably be involved, have been involved in small groups or maybe are right now. Uh, my wife and I were involved in small groups many years ago uh, back in the old building when Pastor David first started life groups. So Margaret and I were one of the f first uh, couples to lead a life group. Um, Parma Orlando, uh, she, she's still, a, well she doesn't attend here, but Molly does, her best friend. Um, anyhow. We, she hosted it, and Margaret and I kind of led it at her house. And there was about 15 of us there in that group, and we met every week. So we picked a night of the week that worked really well. Again, for some of you that are already familiar with life groups, uh, you meet every week, and it was an awesome time of um, food, fellowship, and just hanging out, essentially. So that was a, a great time, and we did that for right around a year and a half, I think, before we raised up another couple that was in the group to kind of lead that group. So Margaret and I we didn't lead it after that point anymore. The idea was to, to break out sometimes and grow other life groups. Um, last I knew, we were right around 20 life groups, I believe, that are still active. I, I think it's in that neighborhood, uh, maybe 18, 19, or 20 different life groups that we have going on, mostly in Kernersville and the surrounding area. Um, but yeah, the, the life groups are also accessible online if you ever wanted to go uh, online to the aboutthebridge.com website, web page. There's a, a, a link on there for life group information. So who is this us referred to down here at the very bottom of, of verse 5? Well, it's referring to Luke. Remember, Luke is the author of this book of Acts. So he's uh, making mention that he has joined this group. I mean, he's been recording all of this information, and for sure he's now for sure with the group, if he wasn't with the group beforehand. But he is there now, and you'll see other pronouns used in the rest of this chapter and other chapters coming up where it says we and us and, and me, uh, and this is referring to Luke again, the author of this book. Verse 6, But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven more days. So Passover was on the 14th day of the month. Remember, Paul wanted to be back in Jerusalem on Passover, but that didn't happen. So he started making his way back up um, through Macedonia, and you notice it took a, a little while to get back up to Philippi. 
So here's where he decided not to go down the boat. So now he's got to make his way all the way back up to Philippi. And by then, now it's Passover. So he's spending Passover in Philippi rather than back in Jerusalem. So Passover was on the 14th day of the month in early spring, and the days of unleavened bread lasted to the 21st day of the month. So from the 14th to the 21st, that's a week. So the unleavened bread celebration lasted a week, and they spent that time there in Philippi. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So the first day of the week I alluded to earlier is Sunday. Uh, why were they meeting on the first day of the week? Well, typically it's accepted, you know, be, because Jesus rose from, the day, for, rose from the dead on the first day of the week. We call this Resurrection Day, essentially. Um, on the cross on Friday, and resurrected on a Sunday, it's Resurrection Day. That's uh, typically how our calendar uh, has now been associated with the first day of the week as being on a Sunday, and that's when Christians gather together to celebrate Jesus raising from the dead. The church, the Christian church, um, doesn't meet on the Sabbath day, which is a Saturday. Um, other denominations uh, do meet on, have church on Saturday, uh, but the Christian church for years and years, thousands of years now, has met on a Sunday as their holy day to, to worship. And what were they doing? They were meeting to break bread. This breaking of bread is what we call communion. So they were breaking bread together in fellowship. And notice it says they were doing this when they came together to break bread on the first day of the week. So it kind of implies that they were doing this every, every Sunday, uh, every week. Um, there's no rule or law or anything that says that um, pat, um, communion is supposed to happen every week. As you know, we do it here the first Sunday of every month. Um, but you can do it much more often, obviously. Uh, there's no time that you can't really do it. Pastor David has even encouraged all of us, if we want to, uh, to have communion at our homes. Um, that's something that uh, Margaret and I and Evan have done uh, several times. We don't do it all the time, but we've done it several times on special occasions for sure. Um, it's pretty cool just to get out whatever type of cracker or piece of bread or um, donut, <laughs> whatever you want to use as a symbol of the Christ's broken body type thing. And it doesn't have to be wine. It can be grape juice or it could be, even Pastor David said, it could be potato chips and Coke. It's just something like that to represent this celebration, this remembrance, essentially, of Jesus and what he did for us, how he died, was buried, and then was resurrected. We celebrate and remember this in communion. So they were meeting to break bread. This is communion. Paul continued his message until midnight. Dun, dun, dun. Man, can you imagine a message going until midnight? Pretty incredible. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. So these lamps were putting off light. And how were they doing that? It's not like they had a lamp like this. They didn't flip on a switch and have electricity. The light was provided by candles. So they had um, either some sort of torch or a candle, typically, that they were using. And these candles, or whatever was putting off this light, was probably making the, their room very smoky, maybe, and pretty much stuffy. Um, so I don't know how big of a crowd that was. I don't think it tells us in Scripture how many were there, but there was many people there in a room maybe this size, and you can imagine 15 different candles around the room to put off enough light for all of us to see. And if we were in here from 8 in the morning till midnight, there's probably quite a bit of aroma and smokiness uh, going on in here. And, and we understand from Scripture that they're going to be in the upper room, which is up on the third floor of this house. So the burning candles were using up all of the oxygen in the room. So imagine if we had... We're going to find out that this upper room does have a window, and we read earlier that Eutychus is in this window, and he's kind of nodding off, and he eventually falls out, right? So why would he be nodding off, besides the fact that it's late, it's midnight, and he's been sitting there for a while, probably listening to Paul preach? But the other side effect of these candles burning is they're putting off carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and chewing up all of the oxygen that's in the room. 
So any of you have been at, at high altitude, you know a lack of oxygen makes it harder to breathe and sometimes it, it could make you sleepy, I guess. And that's the, the point that we're seeing Eutychus in now. He's getting very drowsy besides just the fact of being tired. Verse 9, And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So imagine young Eutychus crouched in a window, his head nodding up and down. You know, you've been in that situation before where you're just really tired, and you've you got the head bob going on, uh, and your, your eyes just kind of pop open every once in a while when your head goes down. Uh, that was Eutychus in the, this third story window. Um, the other, I think Sunday I was in here setting up the sound for um, morning service and I counted the bricks because I, I knew I was doing this teaching and I counted the bricks I was trying to figure out three stories typically a three-story building is around 10 to 12 feet per story so I counted 33 bricks all the way up the, as high as, high as you can see there those bricks are 8 inch tall bricks um, 33 times 8 inches is 22 feet so add another 12 feet or 10 feet to that, now we're up at a three-story high building. If you've been outside this building, you know this is a two-story building essentially, right? We got this floor and then if you've been upstairs, that's a second floor. Add another story to that, that's where Eutychus fell from. So he fell like a rag doll, 30 feet down to the ground, gravel or pavement, doesn't matter, that's a long way to fall, and you're not expecting this. You know, again, he was in this window kind of nodding off. You know, he's got his foot up on the windowsill there, just kind of crouched in the, the header and the sill area there of the, of the jam and the header, I guess, of the window. Anyhow, you get the picture of him falling out of that window. And maybe he was in this deep sleep about where he thinks, maybe his body thinks he's in the middle of a dream and he's getting ready to fly or something. But he's not flying, he's falling. And eventually he falls to the ground dead. So how do we know he's dead? Well, who's the book, this book written by? Luke. And what was Luke's occupation? Doctor, a physician. So he's documenting what he observed. So we can pretty darn well say that this Eutychus young man, this boy, at one point was dead. And then what do we read about? Um, Paul is going to come out and fall upon him, like we read about in other situations here we'll talk about in just a second. So again, the lack of oxygen in the room would have made the young man tired. So that was one reason he fell out. And he fell from the third story, like a rag doll, down onto the ground. Verse 10, But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Wow, that's cool, Paul. How do you know that? It looks like he's kind of a tangled mess, like a rag doll. Um, what's that movie, uh, Toy Story, in the little cowboy? Uh, this isn't in my notes, so I'm trying to remember. Uh, uh, what was it, Andy? Andy the cowboy? Um, I can just imagine him all tangled up and falling down on the ground. And that's what this, <laughs> and this, that's what he looks like here. So Paul fell on him. This is not Paul falling on Eutychus to do CPR. The boy is dead. The boy is dead. So this is similar to the resurrection that we've also read about, um, where the resurrection of the widow's son uh, by Elijah and also by the woman's son, uh, by Elisha in the Old Testament. So there are several different resurrections in Scripture. How many different resurrections uh, have you guys been able to count if you've ever bothered looking? Or how many do you, have you heard anybody else mention how many resurrections there are in the Bible? Okay, Lazarus. Eutychus. Okay, Jesus, raised by God. Uh, Elisha, the woman's son, and Elijah, the widow's son that, we, that I already just mentioned. And then we have Jesus uh, raising Jairus' daughter. And we have Jesus Laz raising Lazarus. And we have Jesus also uh, raising widow's son of Nain. And then finally, Peter raised uh, Dorcas, or her other name was Tabitha. So those seven different resurrections are the ones I came up with. Um, I don't think there's any more, but there might have been. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's a whole lot of people there. Don't know their names, though. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's weird. In Scripture, this is just kind of a side note, all these different people that were resurrected, we, we never hear about their physical second death. Um, uh, it, that's going to be another cool thing to be able to do in heaven someday is to uh, meet up with some of these people and I don't know if you want to bring it up in conversation the first thousand years, but maybe the second ten thousand years when you're more close to them, you know, you can ask them, well, what, what was your second death all about? I mean, it wasn't recorded in scripture. Um, you notice how I said like the second ten thousand years. You know, we're going to be there for eternity. That's a long time to get to know some people. That's going to be some awesome time of fellowship. All right, verse 11. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. So wow, was, not teaching until midnight wasn't quite enough for Paul. After this little shake-up, he broke some bread, got a little food in their stomach, uh, came back up to the upper room, and now he kept on teaching until daybreak. Wow. If he started talking at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning and then continued until daybreak, say 6 a.m., that was roughly a 22-hour sermon with a little bit of a break in there for some food, drink, and maybe a, maybe a bathroom break. But that's a long teaching, wouldn't you say? A long, long sermon there. Pretty amazing. But can you imagine what that teaching must have been like? What type of information did he try to share with the people in that upper room? Um, just kind of walking through maybe the Old Testament, trying to prove Jesus to whoever was in the room uh, from the scriptures. Just like when Jesus was walking on the road of, uh, with the two guys from Emmaus, he was just kind of expounding uh, about the Old Testament as he was walking. Um, and I wonder if that's kind of what Paul was doing. He had to have something in mind as he was teaching for roughly 20, 22 hours uh, during this period of time. Pretty amazing. Verse 12, and they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. So what does this mean, not a little comforted? But basically, I think it means they were kind of stoked. They were kind of pumped up that this kid had fallen out of the window. He was dead, and now he's not. They brought him up and had food with him and broke bread with him. He was resurrected from the dead. So they were not just a little comforted. They were on fire. They were just... Wow, can you imagine what we, what we just witnessed? We're going to have some stories to tell tonight besides what we just learned from Paul, but there was a resurrection that took place. How cool is that to be a part of that? And again, Luke was a doctor, so Luke knew. He, he may have been down there on the scene too, and he kind of looked at him, and he didn't fall on him like Paul did, but I'm sure he had a pretty good clue um, that this Eutychus uh, young man was, was dead, and, but now he's alive. Now he's alive. Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. So sailing from Troas to Asos was about 30 miles by sea, maybe about 20 miles by foot, and Paul walked. Paul walked. He could have taken the boat, but he decided not to. He must have wanted some more of that alone time. Uh, that we were talking about earlier. It is a way, a great way to meditate. Um, I enjoy walking. Um, I have an opportunity at my workplace where I can probably walk two or three times a day, not long walks. Like uh, we have break times that you can take or you don't have to take. Uh, but in the morning at 9.30, you can walk, you can do whatever you want for 15 minutes if you want. It's allowed. And then there's the lunch hour. And then from 2.30 to 2.45, there's another break uh, allotment of time. So when the weather's nice, I usually head out, and you know, in 15 minutes, you can do quite a bit. Um, so I usually walk um, anywhere from five to 10,000 steps a day, and uh, a lot of that time is just spent uh, either listening to a podcast or a teaching or just um, looking at nature type thing. Uh, oftentimes, I've taken pictures with my phone and posted them on Twitter or Facebook, um, just as some, especially some in the spring and late fall when there are certain trees that are blossoming. Uh, and they cover a couple of the walkways that I go on. It's just very beautiful to see all the different colors, the butterflies, the birds, uh, the caterpillars. I mean, it's just tons of different uh, animals and flowers that you can see when you're out and about, and if you take the time to notice. But it's important to take this time and notice 
um, because it rejuvenates us. Uh, spending time with nature is very important, I think. And um, Paul, evidently, um, maybe, I mean, I just, this just came to me. I'm wondering, you know, when he spent that three years in Arabia being taught by Jesus himself, how many different times were Paul there in Arabia where he, he was, for all we know, alone, that he just, he, he must have learned to really enjoy spending time alone and meditating and just kind of taking things in. And this is something that we need to be able to do. Um, and that's kind of what the next life lesson is going to be about. Uh, alone time is great for the body, soul, and spirit. Don't neglect any of them. Alone time is great for the body, soul, and spirit. No, don't neglect any of them. And I already mentioned a little bit, you know, Jesus often would wake early to pray. In several passages in the Gospels, we read about the disciples looking for Jesus. Where did Jesus go? And oftentimes it, it said he would get up at daybreak or before dawn and go find a quiet place and pray. Um, and Jesus would, well, I just said it right there, he would just find a quiet place. And Paul needed that quiet time. Maybe he just needed to download, decompress from that teaching that he had. I mean, he just had pulled an all-nighter, and then he decides to walk 20 miles while the other guys hop on the boat and start sailing 30, 30 miles along the coast. And these other guys, I'm sure, did what? They probably got on the boat, found a nice soft board to lay on, <laughs> and went to sleep, Taking a, took a nice little nap. Uh, but Paul was walking the whole time. Pretty amazing. Verse 14 and 15. And when he met us at Asos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. The next day we came to Miletus. So the map once again shows us how they're taking these short hops from Troas. Paul walked this distance right here from Troas to Asos. Paul got on the boat finally from here and started making their way down to Mytilene, Chios, Samos, and now they're in Trogilium, or Miletus, I mean. So uh, little one-day trips, basically, to uh, make their way down the coastline and allowing Paul to uh, walk quite a bit, too. But I was curious, you know, I'd mentioned early on that Paul wanted originally to go to Jerusalem on Passover, but he couldn't, spent Passover in Philippi. So now, after doing all this backtracking and doing Passover in Philippi, spending a week there for the Days of Unleavened Bread, and now making his way back, is he going to make it back in time for Pentecost or not? How much time has elapsed? Well, I, I was curious, so I put it into a little spreadsheet, made a little timeline, um, so back here we got Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, and then I was able to track in verse 6 all the way through to verse 16 and all these different places that they ended up being. And now we're out here at day 25. He's in Miletus that we see in verse 15. Day 25 to day 50 probably has enough time yet to make it back to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So that was just the nerd in me trying to track some of the days to see if we can uh, make it back to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost or not. Verse 16, For Paul had decided to pale, sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So why didn't he want to spend any more time in Asia? He knew if he... Uh, stopped back in Ephesus once again. I can't remember if it was Pastor Nick or Kevin or Pastor David or somebody mentioned the same verse, I think, recently, that, you know, if he had gone back to Ephesus, he's got a lot of friends there. Most likely the people would have known that he was coming and they would have come out to meet him at the shore and they would have wanted to invite him to their house and spend some time fellowshipping. You know, usually when they do that, it was a day or two or a week. Uh, and he didn't have that time to spare if he wanted to make it back to Jerusalem in time for Pentecost. So that's why he kind of skipped past Ephesus. So again, so that he wouldn't have to spend that little bit of time there in Asia. So the, in, the entire spring religious season of Israel from Passover to Pentecost speaks of God's plan to harvest a holy people for himself. First, Yeshua died as a perfect, sinless sacrifice. 
Um, what I'm reading right now is just some notes from my um, study Bible. Uh, so these aren't my words. These are just words that I thought were, um, would fit right here in verse um, 16 pretty well. First, Yeshua died as a perfect sinless sacrifice. Then he arose and became the first fruits from the dead as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. So what does that verse say? But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Seven weeks after the resurrection, the dynamic manifestation of the Holy Spirit among the early Jewish believers became the catalyst for many to put their faith in God's Messiah. Today, Pentecost should speak to us of the sowing of the gospel seed and harvesting or ingathering of saved souls, redeemed people to become part of the body of Christ. God wants such a harvest from every kindred, tribe, and nation. So where else in, uh, I was, when I read that, um, I think I got this bit of information also from the Haley's Bible Handbook, but when I read that about every kindred, tribe, and nation, I was wondering, well, I know I've read that, that type of wording before, so I, the only place I could find it, there may be others too, but it was here in Matthew chapter 28, uh, 18, 19, and 20, and you can see I highlighted there in red uh, about the nations. And from the reading I had here, it said, God wants to harvest Christians from every kindred, tribe, and nation. And then here in Matthew 28, we read, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our final life lesson, how committed are you to this walk of faith we call Christianity? How committed are you to this walk of faith we call Christianity? Do you consider yourself a Jesus or a God follower? And the reason I came up with this life lesson is because after reading what I read and covering, you know, in the first 20 chapters of Acts, you just get an amazing picture of who this Paul was. Remember when I read from the Haley's Bible Handbook how, you know, God just kept him alive supernaturally because he had a mission for Paul to do. And Paul was, you've all read the verses in 1 Corinthians where he was just shipwrecked many times beaten many times, left for dead a couple of times, stoned a couple of times, whipped and beaten with rods a couple of times. I mean, God's hand had to be on Paul to keep him alive and keep him walking 20 miles after teaching for 22 hours. This guy was, um, you know, um, Steve mentioned last week that um, because of the time that Paul was born, closely to the time that Jesus was born, they're about the same age, here we are in AD 57, so Paul's about 57 right now. So imagine yourself staying up all night, pulling an all-nighter, teaching a group of men for 22 hours, and then not getting on a boat, but walking 20 miles at 57 years of age, roughly. So that, this guy is amazing, and you know, when I was typing up this life lesson, you know, how committed am I? How committed are we to act like Paul? He was the real deal. Man, he, um, you know, Pastor David and the other pastors have talked so much about Paul, and it's true. That he's just an amazing testimony of God's faith, love, mercy, uh, and everything. So if you consider yourself a Jesus or a God follower, Try to emulate and be like Paul to the best we can, but basically just try to be committed to our walk of faith that we call Christianity. And I know probably none of us are going to be able to compare ourselves to Paul. Uh, he just was out there. He was just too amazing uh, for us to possibly uh, accomplish whatever he, I mean, the great things that he accomplished. Two-thirds of the New Testament and just all the different multitudes that he uh, witnessed to is just amazing. So I'm just going to leave you with that. How committed are you to this walk of faith we call Christianity? How is it going to change you when you leave here tonight? Will it change you? I mean, will it cause you to think about anything? Uh, maybe in your marriage, uh, maybe in any um, relationships you have if you have a girlfriend or if you're married, 
or even relationships at your workplace, uh, any friends or any family members? Is there any type of situation that you haven't been the God follower that you sometimes claim to be? Um, have you ever found yourself being a hypocrite, saying one thing and doing another? Especially if you have kids, you've got to watch out for that because kids catch a lot of things that we do more so than what we say. What's the phrase they're saying? Uh, more things are caught than taught. Um, so we really have to pay attention when we have kids around, those young ones. They're really listening and paying attention to what we're saying, whether, they, whether we think they are or not. But back to just a personal relationship with Jesus. How committed are you? And what might you change between now and Sunday, now and next week when we meet again? There's a, a possibility for you to change dramatically or a possibility of you to just to change a little bit. All it takes is a, a choice on each and every one of our parts to, to make little changes for the better. Uh, again, don't try to compare yourself to Paul, uh, but he is certainly a high standard and Jesus a much higher standard to follow. So with that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for our time together. Lord, we just look for, or I look forward to um, sharing the next week with the rest of this Acts chapter 20. Uh, Lord, I just pray that all the men here in this room, Lord, that they'll, uh, wherever they may be in their Bible study time, Lord, I pray that you would uh, allow them to have that time set aside in their schedule to, to read and to study uh, wherever they're at and just uh, learn something from your word and then apply whatever they learn in their daily activities. Allow them to share it with someone so that that someone, whoever it might be, knows that they're a God follower because they're sharing with me whatever they learn from Scripture. Maybe it's just memorization of a, a verse, or maybe it's an application of a, a, a principle that they read about in Scripture that they haven't been applying, but now they're trying to apply. There's just so many different ways, Lord, that we can learn and apply from your, from your Scripture. And Lord, help us to do that. And Lord, again, thank you for the men here in, the, in tonight. Um, just bless us all with safety as we leave here and go our separate ways. And Lord, just bring us back together once again safely Thursday and then again on Sunday and next Tuesday and so on. And Lord, just thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.